Private Lender Podcast, Episode 43. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Thomas Jefferson, who said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Hello and welcome to the Private Lender Podcast. If you're looking for ways to diversify your investments and mitigate risks, then you're in the right place. This is the only podcast dedicated to creating and supporting knowledgeable and successful private lenders. My name is Keith Baker and I'm on a mission to create an alternative economy where people like you and me invest without banks or Wall Street brokers. You're listening to episode 43 and today I will spare you guys a rant as I'll be speaking with Tom Barry from Investor Loan Source a very, very valuable funding source for real estate investors. I'd like to go ahead and thank you guys for sharing your time with me today. After all, it is your most valuable asset, and I really hope you do enjoy the interview with Tom. I know I had fun recording it. But before we get into the heart of today's episode, I'd like to give a thank you and a shout out to Sammy Gupta at CountyTaxSaleApp.org and their sponsorship of this episode. This episode of the Private Lender Podcast is proudly sponsored by CountyTaxSaleApp.org. With CountyTaxSaleApp.org, you get a very powerful lead generation tool in the palm of your hand, on your laptop, desktop, or any device you choose. Get real-time alerts for between 300 and 600 properties every month that are coming up for the foreclosure auction in Harris County, Texas, the third largest county in the United States. With this intuitive design and interface, the County Tax Sale app lets you search all properties with highly motivated sellers that are coming up for foreclosure auction. Simply search the map and click on a property to learn important details about that property, such as the address, owner's contact info, minimum bid, and a street view photo. You can save properties to your favorites and contact the sellers directly and receive email and text alerts if one of your favorite properties is redeemed or canceled prior to the auction. You can even listen to Sammy Gupta on episode 28 of this podcast as he discusses all the powerful features and benefits of CountyTaxSaleApp.org. For more information, go to the Private Lender Podcast sponsor page, the show notes page for this episode, or to CountyTaxSaleApp.org. That's CountyTaxSaleApp.org. And I'd like to ask, if you can hear my voice right now, please go to CountyTaxSaleApp.org. And check it out. Even if you don't live in Houston or Texas or even the United States, you can research Harris County, Texas foreclosure properties anywhere in the world on any device for less than three cents a day. You just can't beat that many leads for pennies a day. And I would greatly appreciate if you go check them out. Give them a try. Kick the tires. I mean, even if you do a month, eight bucks, you can learn a tremendous amount just by using this app playing with it, going through, looking at the properties. Yeah, it's a pretty cool thing. So I'd also like to thank 713 RIA for their sponsorship of the Private Lender Podcast. I usually go to their monthly meetings. I have a vendor table, and I've been able to meet several listeners who have stopped by and said hello. For example, Clint and Peter. And I want to thank Ryan Sanders for sending those guys over to say hello. I went to high school with Ryan. haven't seen him in many, many years, but I do understand he's a fellow brother of the oil field, although he was uh, he stuck it out a heck of a lot longer than I did. <laughs> but anyway, I do want to say thank you to Ryan. If you're listening, hit me up on social, and I hope you're doing well. Anyhow, the uh, back to the point being that, yeah, at the 713 RIA meetings, yeah, stop by, say hello. It's the second Wednesday of every month at 125 Airtex and I-45 North in Houston. So if you're flying in or you're flying out either, this is pretty close to uh, Bush Intercontinental Airport on the north side. So definitely, definitely check it out. And please stop by and say hello, and uh, I'll be happy to buy you a drink. Okay, so now we've paid the bills. I have a question for you. Are you an investor looking for funding for your next fix and flip, or maybe your next rental? Or maybe even you're a owner finance or seller financer looking for some funding that you can wrap to sell to your end client, your buyer, tenant. or 
that's not more than one. I guess that's more than one question. But if you're an investor or a lender who's looking to passively invest in real estate while others do the work, well, then you're in luck because Tom Barry will loan you money for your deals, and or both, he will put your money to work by lending in, on, into mortgages backed by real estate. Now there is it's really geared for accredited investors. That's interest for quick math. You and your spouse have to make three hundred thousand dollars a year, or you as a single person can make must make two hundred thousand dollars a year, or have a million dollar net worth that does not include your homestead or your your primary residence. But it this is uh, I've been waiting to get Tom on the on the show for a while. Very happy he agreed, and um, I even had to postpone on him at the last minute because things got busy at uh, at the day job. Uh, he was gracious enough to reschedule and to give me a great interview. So without any further ado, let's go ahead and get to the interview with Tom Barry. Lender Nation, I am more than honored and pleased to introduce to you Mr. Tom Barry, who is with Investor Loan Source and is the very reason that I have this podcast and that I'm a private lender today. It's your fault, Tom. So Tom, welcome to the Private Lender Podcast. Thank you. And yeah, I'm honored to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. I met Tom about a decade ago at Quest IRA in Houston. He was out, he was looking for money. And I th- he has a great hero background story. So let, comic book number one, what, uh, how did you get into real estate? And we'll, we'll get to Investor Loan Source, but how did you, uh, I know you came from a different background, uh, like most of us in real estate. So kind of give us your background story, please. Sure, Keith. Well, my wife and I had a financial services firm for over a decade. And we had just moved from Ohio down to Texas about a year before the financial bubble burst. And so in 2007, we basically lost everything. We went from riding really high in 2006 to absolutely nothing in 2007. So we were part of a lot of people that were out there looking for work and trying to figure out what the heck we were going to do next. And I couldn't find a job. I mean, I put out resumes. I couldn't even get a phone call. So I told my wife one day, I said, you know what? Nobody's going to offer me a job. I'm just going to make one. And she's like, what does that even mean? You know? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I said, well, if I don't have a job, I got to do something. You know, I got to start some kind of a little business, a little company, something. And I'd always wanted to do real estate and my other job and, and my other career just never really allowed the opportunity timing wise. So I guess the opportunity was given me and it was really a blessing in disguise. Obviously, we didn't look at it as such at the time, but it allowed me to get into real estate. And we started just like most people that are starting where we were financially. We started out wholesaling and then we figured out how we could do a couple of fix and flips. And then we figured out, hey, we could keep some of these as rentals. And over the course of the next 48 months, we accumulated 425 doors made well over 100000 a year every year, including our first year in cash, and we're completely and totally financially independent and multimillionaires. Wow. And <laughs> just because you said you got to do something and no one would hire you. Yeah, well, it kind of pissed me off, you know? I guess necessity is the mother of invention, right? It I mean, that's... I'm not a person to just sit around on my hands and wait for somebody to come give me something. If there's no opportunity out there, I'm going to go make one. And that's basically what it was, was I was just angry. I was angry, not at anybody in particular. I was angry at my position and my situation at that point in my life. I mean, I was over 40 years old and I couldn't get a job. And that is the first time in my career that I couldn't get a job. What were you doing prior to the crash? Prior to that, as I said, we owned our own financial services firm. And then prior to that, I was in corporate management. I was basically what's called a a turnaround specialist for companies that have a problem. Okay. It might be one store that's not profitable or one depot that's not profitable. I always took the non-profitable ones and it was the challenge for me was to see how quickly I could beat the profitable ones. Okay. No, that makes sense. And I see the parallel into flipping in real estate. Yes, (laughs) exactly. I was trained for this. I just didn't know it. Yeah, right. Yeah, you just didn't know it at the time. Okay. I remember you telling your story, like I said, about a decade ago. So I, because I remember thinking 
like this guy's got a lot of hustle in him and a lot of people will go and you, know, you meet him at Ria's or quest events or whatever and meetups and I still have that your original car it's got a card a business card it's got a palm tree on it I remember in one of the corners and uh, that's true that's true yeah. I haven't thought about that logo in years <laughs> yeah because I pulled it out the other day when I was, uh, I was I was getting ready for this I was like oh man look at that I couldn't believe it but uh so I'm curious how much in that time before you know you got into investor loan source and whatnot how much money did you borrow from private lenders while from say for just from Quest or any other IRA custodian? Right. So we bought over $18 million worth of real estate over the last, and I honestly stopped counting about two years ago. So let's say the first eight years, we bought roughly $18 million worth of real estate. And of that 18 million, I used $1,000 of my own money. <laughs> so. That's a whole different story on why I did that. But I actually bought a house for $1,000 and it would have cost me 450 to get the legal docs done to borrow the money. And that just wouldn't have made financial sense. So I did suck up my pride and use my money for that particular purchase. Someone who espouses the beauty of OPM, other people's money, I'll allow that. I think that's <laughs> so, Other than that one oddball deal, we've never used our own money in. I would also say we've done a lot of other things with private money too. Purchased some houses is what we started with, but then we bought apartment buildings and then we moved up to buying apartment complexes. We bought office buildings. We bought self storages. I bought a dumpster rental and excavating company. I started a pawn shop, a gun store. I bought a hunting ranch. I mean, I've done a lot of stuff with private money outside of just buying single family homes as well. Okay. I'm disappointed that I did not know you took private money to start the hunting ranch. So we'll talk offline about that later, but I, I'm, <laughs> I am glad to hear that. It's all right. So $18 million, or was it most of it from uh, uh, IRA clients? Or? Yeah. I would say IRA is probably made up well over half of it. Well over half, probably 60% or so if I were to put a percentage on it. Yeah. Nice. Nice. And, that, and that's why I tell people, go to these meetups. We were both at the uh, Quest Expo in Dallas back in August. And that was a great, great experience. And that's, I always tell people, look, go, go, go. These people put on free events all the time. Go meet with investors. Go meet with other lenders and compare notes, trade, you know, some uh, trades, uh, sort of swap secrets. But so that's great. That's, I didn't realize it was over 60% or 60% all private. So it's going to kind of segue into... I remember you telling a story once that you're a private lender had called you and said that he had a problem that he needed to put money to work because he didn't want it back in his accounts. And that you be that all the time. Yeah. You being Johnny hustles, like we'll find a place to put it. <laughs> you know, don't worry about that. We'll go. You and your partner came together and, and tell us about how you came to uh, create investor loan source. Investor loan source kind of came out of, again, necessity. Pretty much every company I have has come from necessity. And with Loan Source, the problem was we were selling off our apartment complexes at a very rapid rate in 2016 and 17. The prices were just at a point I was getting offers. Honestly, I didn't think the properties were worth what they were offering. So I was more than happy to let them go. And that created an issue. It created an issue because now for the first time in my career since being in real estate, I actually had some cash because I was getting some of that equity. You know, on paper, I looked really good, but it was just on paper until we actually sold those properties and saw that equity in our bank account. So that was a problem. What do you do with that? Particularly when you're in the market cycle, doesn't allow for finding real good deals like we were finding in prior years. The other challenge that we were presented with was all of my lenders were howling at me because now they're getting these massive amounts of money back and they don't want it back. They want to continue to get their interest payments from Melissa, my wife who makes the payments. So, I mean, I was literally inundated with phone calls. What do you mean you're paying? I just got a payoff request. What's happening? Why are you doing this? We don't want the money back. <laughs> so we were literally looking at millions and millions of dollars that were available and there's nothing to buy. I could not place it for the first time in my career. I had way more money available to me than I had deal. Prior to that, it was always, I had plenty of deals on the table and I was scraping and scrounging and making phone calls to get the money put together. 
this time it's a totally opposite situation. And I said, what could we do to fix this? And so I called up Donald Sutton, who was my fourth private lender. And Donald, I knew, had been raising capital from folks in his hometown for years and years. And he had a pretty good little pool of cash, his families, his friends, and other people in the area. And I said, you know what? We ought to start a lending company together. And he says, well, I have X number of dollars under management. I think it was like $6 million at the time. He says, what do you have? And I said, I, I could kick in a million bucks or so. And he's like, well, how, I don't understand how that's equitable. And I said, well, here's how it's equitable. You don't know how to lend. You just got lucky with the borrower. You have never known how to lend. And any other borrower, you could have got your butt handed to you. Hmm. You just got lucky you were lending to me. <laughs> and I knew how to vet deals. And this is instructive for people that want to be private lenders. Absolutely. Most people should not be private lenders because they don't know how to vet a deal. They don't know how to vet a borrower. They don't know how to vet the paperwork. They don't know the legalities involved. They don't know how to read a title commitment and know what the heck it means. They don't know what uh, title company endorsements they need on the title policy, on their lenders. I mean, I could go on and on for 20 minutes about the things most people who are trying to be private lenders don't know how to do correctly. In Donald's case, he didn't know how to vet a deal and he didn't know how to do the numbers. He didn't know anything about repairs and he didn't know anything about vetting a borrower. And that could have been extremely detrimental to him given the amount of money we had of his. Mm -hmm. At one point, we had over $3.5 million of his money. And giving money to people it has to be a methodical thing. Private lending is great if you know what you're doing. It can be a horror story if you don't. So when I talk to him about, look, you he's great at the details. He's great at knowing the title policy stuff and what should be in a note and what should be in a deed of trust and what should how the assignment of rents and all the other things that go along with lending should be. And that's crap I don't want to deal with. I don't want to learn it. I really don't. I don't ever want to be good at that. But what I'm good at is real estate, and I'm good at the people part. So I can vet the people, and I can vet the deal, and I can go walk a property and know if the repair estimate is reasonably close and correct or not. So I explained to him, putting your talents and mine together, I know you think you're doing great right now, but it's just because you got lucky. You got a good, big borrower. And without that good, big borrower, you're going to get your butt handed to you at some point. And he agreed. We started that company five years ago. Uh, he had a little office in his house. I had a little office in my house. And we kicked it off. And I think as of yesterday, we have 21 employees now. 20, wow. Wow. Last time I, I had I count, I think it was like around nine or so. So you've already doubled. That's Man, that's good. Yeah. So we run out of two offices. I handle the marketing side. I handle creating new loan products. I handle creating uh, opening new markets, going into different states. All of those types of things, as far as growth orientation, are on my plate. And then we also handle in my office vetting of the deals. All the underwriting takes place in our office. And once we've got it underwritten and, and approved, and we say yes, this is a great deal. We'd love to rent. We'd love to lend on it. Then that file is taken to Donald's office and he takes it through to closing and beyond into servicing. Interesting. Huh. So you guys put some money together. How do you source your funds currently? Is it just yours and Donald's money or are you accepting? No. Well, that's what we started with, but we quickly ran out of that. <laughs> yes. The biggest problem private lenders have. Yeah. Well, sure. I mean, we brought out some unique loan products. There are very few hard money lenders that have products like ours. In fact, I would argue we have some that no other hard money lenders have. And it's because we created them. We invented them. And I created those products based on what I know as a real estate investor and what I wish I had when I was starting out as a real estate investor. So that has given us an opportunity where we don't have any competition. So we are constantly growing. Every month is bigger than the one before. It seems like, I know that's probably an exaggeration, but certainly every year has been larger than the one before. And so we're constantly out of money. 
And it, <laughs> it's been a joke with us. We were out of money when we had six million. We're out of money when we had 10. We're out of money when we had 15 and on and on. But as we grow the amount of money that we keep in play, we still always have a huge appetite for more. I think last year, we wrote 46 million in loans just in 2017. And I know we may not double that this year, but I know we'll eclipse it. We'll certainly eclipse it. So that's the kind of volume we're writing. And to answer your question, the one thing we don't do for sourcing money is we do not and never have to this point ever used a penny of bank money. I'm yes. using the same rule that I used when I built my real estate portfolio. I never used bank money ever, not a penny. Now that I'm to where I am with my portfolio, I am refinancing out of a lot of those private loans. Again, got my lenders howling again because banks are throwing money at me really cheap now. Yeah, That's cool. a great opportunity. And of course, we're taking those lenders and moving them to ILS and we're still taking care of them and we're still able to put their money to work for them there as well. I love you're a man after my own heart because a goal with this podcast is creating and training private lenders how to do it, how to do it right, how to do it safely, and taking banks and brokers out of the equation. And you've that's been your MO from the start. And the fact that you've done all this money without any, or all these loans, I should say, without bank money. If I had one of those radio buttons where I could hit like a big a stadium full of applause, it would be going on right now because <laughs> that makes me very, very happy to hear. <laughs> That's the whole point and the beauty of being a private lender, even lending into something like Investor Loan Source that gets where the professionals vet it out and then put the money to work. And as they say, it, you, know, you get that mailbox money every month. And like, like when your loan uh, lenders don't get lump sum back, that, it, that makes me nervous. I want to see my money working for me. I don't. Well, that's what, yeah. And that, that's constantly what I hear from my lenders when we're paying off it, whether it was when we were selling apartment complexes and we were paying off huge amounts of money then, or when I'm like last week, I refinanced 34 properties, 34 single family homes. Well, again, that put a lot of money back into my lender's hands. And of course, I, I was prepared. I knew the phone calls, emails, and texts would start coming in. But this time I had a quick fix for it. And the quick fix for it for them was real simple. They could move the money into our private equity fund, which then we use to make short-term loans on fix and flip properties. And we give that profit back to the investors in that fund. Or if they don't like fund investing for whatever reason, and some people are weird about it, some people just have to have a first lien position deed of trust in their palm. Well, that's fine. Uh, we'll sell them some of our long-term notes. As we write these notes, we can't sit on them for 10 years, 20 years, whatever the case may be. So we'll sell those notes to IRA holders or people with some cash that just are looking for a good strong yield and don't want to go to the stock market to get it. It's backed by a first lien deed of trust on a rental property with a tenant in it. It's cash flowing. So it's about the safest piece of paper you could buy. And it works real well for IRA holders in particular. It, it's consistent. That's what I love, especially now that we're, we're somewhere long in the tooth in this market cycle, both from a real estate and stock market standpoint. Agreed. Yeah. And so I always love to ask people, I'm not going to ask you this because it's unfair, but if the market cycle were a nine inning baseball game, you know, what inning are we in? And I'm thinking like, we're like in the 14th inning right now, <laughs> you know, we're like so far beyond the normal, what's quote unquote normal, what history has, has showed us. There are a few things that have propped that up and elongated this cycle. And I actually do a lot of study on market cycles. That's how I made my wealth, playing market cycles. We bought houses when no one else would buy them and just put tenants in them and cash flowed them and, and held them. And now I'm selling off a few a month because the prices have, in my opinion, are just to a point where I can't afford not to sell them off. Yeah. We did the same thing in 2011 and 12. We started buying apartment complexes because the brokers couldn't give them away. I had huge brokerages up in Houston that would call me. I mean, they actually had my phone number, my cell number. They actually called me back then. And would ask me, hey, Tom, will you go buy such and such apartment complex and tell me what you give for it? 
I don't even want the listing if you won't buy it because you're the only guy buying down there. And I had those conversations in 2011 and 12. Now, those same brokers have forgotten my name now. (laughs) When I do run across them at a meeting, I always joke with them, hang on to my number. Don't delete me from your phone because we're not too awful far away from you calling me again. Yeah. And I mean that sincerely. Now, they, of course, take issue with that. But I'm joking, but they know I'm not, too, at the same time. Right, yeah. So. I'm curious. We got in the market cycle. I had to ask you, uh, you know, I had to ask you by not asking you, so to speak. So if somebody's listening to this says, hey, I want to be a private lender and I highly recommend, I'm one of those people, I want that first position lean. And that's what I, I tell people. That's your, your most secure thing. You get into funds. It's a little bit different of a conversation at that point in time. I'm a fan of both. And I'll tell you why, because one, I could hand over some money to investor loan source and sit back and relax. Because you guys have the fiduciary duty to do the due diligence and to put that money into a a sound investment vehicle. Because of that, probably not going to get a huge return. But look, if I get a constant return on my investment that I don't have to go and work it every six months, every 12 months, to me, that's worth. I always thought exactly what you just said. But I know now through experience that that is not entirely accurate. Let me explain. Please do. So let's take the short-term fund, for example, where we do fix and flip loans out of. We write those loans uh, anywhere from 1199, 1099, and 1399 interest rates. Okay. So let's blend that together. Say there's an equal mix in the fund of those rates, and that makes it 1199, right? Okay. So now the fund, obviously, we're going to lose 2% for fund management yep. right off the top. So now we're down to 999, and you would think that's pretty much what the expected return will be. And I'll be honest with you, when we wrote private placement memorandum for that fund, that's exactly what we wrote. We wrote that we believe the fund will return between 10 and 12% interest. Okay? Mm -hmm. Here's what we found. We found some places on Wall Street. We found some places out in California that would like to have pieces of our loans. Okay. Mm -hmm. We call it fractionalizing. So we sell, let's hypothetically say we sell 80% of an 1199 loan for 7.9%. We keep the other 20%. Now, my partner is a quantitative mathematician by trade. I'm not. I'm pretty good at simple math, but he's good at the complex math. So he built a spreadsheet to quickly throw these numbers in. And that example that I just gave you returns a yield of over 20% to the fund. Because you're selling off some of that income stream. Yes. And we're selling it at a premium. Because on 80% of that loan, we're making 4% annualized, and we have $0 in that 80%. Beautiful. Match that with the other 20% that we get an 11.99 on because we own the full 20%. Now you can see how a sharp and shrewd financial guy could take 11% loans and turn them into a much better return than what you might expect. So I've never said this before, and you can certainly ask my wife, that I've never been so happy to be proven wrong. That is, you know, I never kind of thought of it like that. But at the same time, you're still doing all the work. If I'm in that fund, I'm gaining some of the benefit of that. Well, you're gaining all the benefit of that. I mean, all the benefit of the upside, but I mean, as far as not doing the work. And And so are we because we own 20% of the fund. Yeah. So we're working for ourselves and our investors side by side. What we did, because we know how to do this. We know how to make money, but we want to do it on a larger scale. So we've said, come along with us. Let's throw some cash together and come along with us. And so normal everyday guys and gals that have that job out there, they got a W-2 a 60 hour work week, they don't have time to do the things that we do. They can still put their money in, get the benefits of our experience. That's, I didn't realize it was to that extent. I'm very happy that you, you, you interjected there. And Keith, that's just one strategy. I could share several others with you. We don't have time, I'm sure. And that's not the point of this podcast, but that's just one really good, easy example of how a yield can be much larger than what you might expect. That's great. Because you know, everyone asks always, oh, if I'm at a RIA meeting and 
you know, they see private lender podcast, they automatically assume that I've got tons of cash and I'm loaning it out. And they're like, what are your rates? What are your terms? I'm like, well, no, it's, it's not that simple. And in, in your case, it is, but it isn't. Like you said, you get into the quantitative and the fractionalizing of it, which I'm going to go ahead and book you now. We'll go down that rabbit hole in another episode in a few months because I definitely want to, <laughs> to bring people along with that. Because the beauty of Ray Sasser, another you know, Houston heavyweight, recommended the Jim Napier book, Invest in Debt. And it, it has changed my life reading that. And uh, full disclosure, I failed business math in college three times. I dropped it three times. I took one F. I'm sorry, I dropped it twice and I took an F. And I've ended up having to go to a junior college to finish up my degree with, with one math course. So it, as shameful as that is, it's the truth. However, once I read how it, it broke down and how you can sell a portion, like you were talking about, you sell a portion, a percentage of that loan off, how it can increase your yield. And so what looks like 7%, is actually going to be a lot more at the end of the day. And yeah, what we find is there's a lot of large money out there that is happy as heck with a seven to eight percent yield. Mm -hmm. Can we take that money and leverage it and provide opportunity for investors? Absolutely. Absolutely. And those guys, most generally, they don't have the contacts we have, they don't have the ins in the communities that we have. So they rely on us to be able to bring them this paper at those types of yields. And they're tickled to death to take all of what we can bring them. I bet. Yeah. No, that's yeah, everyone's appetite for risk and yield is different. So that, and yeah, and like you said, leverage it. No, that's in full disclosure, to be involved in this fund, one would have to be an accredited investor. Okay. That's my next question. Yeah. And I want to make that full disclosure. So that brought up another challenge. What if somebody is not an accredited investor? And they really don't have a lot of experience with rehabbing, construction, flipping, or anything like that, which means they probably really shouldn't be lending on fix and flip loans because there is a chance you end up with that challenge. You know, you end up with that property halfway through the project. So how could we help those folks? So I said, you know what? Let's sell them our long-term paper. We've already vetted these long-term loans are on already fixed up properties, right? Mm -hmm. So if we qualify somebody for one of our rental loans, that property is already in good enough condition. It's already rented out. There aren't any fix and flip issues, construction issues to have to mess somebody up along the way. So we just sell them that paper and they can ride that yield. We sell it at par. So if we got 80 grand out, we sell it for 80 grand. We don't try to, to mark it up or anything. And they can just set that in their IRA or set it off to the side and just ride that yield to maturity. If they don't want to keep it for the full 20 years or whatever the term is, on all of our long-term loans, when we sell those to investors, we have a five-year buyback guarantee in the paperwork, which says if you held it for five years or more and you need that cash for something else, no questions asked. We will buy that paper back from you at any time after the 60th month. Really? Absolutely. Why wouldn't we? Think about this, Keith. How does paper get more or less valuable the further the debt is paid down? It'd be, uh, the further the debt's paid down more? Absolutely. So why wouldn't I be willing to pay face value to take that debt back and pay them their principal back and let them move on? I'll turn around and sell it to somebody else. Now, it's been seasoned five years. I can probably go to Wall Street and sell it at a premium. Yeah, you could probably get into the funds, the hedge funds and whatnot. Or, or exactly. would probably, yeah, okay. Exactly. So why would I not be able to offer that guarantee? It's a guarantee that I know I'll rarely ever have to, to do. But if I do, I'll be happy to because that paper will be worth more at that time. Yeah, well, that, no, it makes sense. I, it, for me, I, I guess my thing is like you're guaranteeing. I'm like never guarantee. Uh, that comes from my insurance background. <laughs> you, don't, you don't ever guarantee anything. But that's, no, that's a great, I think that's a great philosophy. I mean, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Was, and especially if something is seasoned and is performing, there's a lot of marketability there, not just back to you guys, but to somebody else. And the other thing going to performing, which is a, a term you just used, the other guarantee that we have in those same notes is that if you ever have to foreclose on the property, we'll buy it back at the total unpaid balance. Okay. Now, we can do that because those long-term notes, we have a $16 million track record. We've written $16 million of just those notes over the last four years. This month, we are actually 
this is our anniversary of our fourth year writing rental loans. And we know that out of that $16 million, that represented 200 notes exactly as of last week. And of those 200 notes, one of them were foreclosed on. That was a loan on a $52,444 loan. We did buy it back from the note holder, just like we said we would. And I turned around and sold that house to the tenant for $72,000 on owner finance terms. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So why would I not give that guarantee? Now, just because the guarantee is in there doesn't mean that the note holder has to sell it back to us. I want to make that clear. If they want to do what we did with the house and make that extra 20 grand, they are more than, than welcome to do that. But for those that just don't have an appetite for handling those things, the guarantee is there to give them the comfort that they'll never have to deal with it. If they just want their 52 grand back, no problem. We will pay the full unpaid principal balance and we'll deal with the property for them because we are equipped to do that. Yeah. That's great. That's like, it's very creative. And it's, I mean, like it's an option that's already written in. There's the right, but not the obligation to exercise that option if something goes south. And I think that's a great mechanism because a lot of, I know I myself speaking personally, my first loan, I didn't sleep that night because I was so nervous about it. And, and that really removes a lot of the indecision and the negativity out of it. Like, look, I'm going to get par back on what I loan. That's phenomenal. That's all the interest that they've earned. Yeah. Yeah. Plus, yeah. Plus what, what's been paid up. So do you, okay, let's own a same question, but from a lending and a borrowing perspective. So I know you guys are in Texas, obviously. Do you loan to other properties in other states? I assume you accept money from invest uh, lenders from other states, but do you loan out in other states? You mentioned that earlier. Yeah. So yes, we can accept investors from other states and do. We have some from out of state already. And no, we do not lend outside of Texas as of today. Now, I will tell you that there are huge plans being worked on right now through our tech team and our compliance team. And we are working diligently to be able to launch into four to five other states by the first of the year. I cannot at this moment say which states simply because we're still working through the compliance issues. Sure. And if they are too onerous, I may change states <laughs> between now and then and go into easier ones. But we have picked our favorite five and we are working to see if we can make those happen. If some are a real, real pain in the tail to work with, I may go to my second choice on a few of them and circle back later. I understand. I'm going to take a shot in the dark here and you don't have to answer, but I'm going to assume I know what happens when you assume me. I make an ass out of you. Yeah, and you. Yeah, but, yeah. but I'm going to assume that the foreclosure laws are very similar to Texas and that they're speedy. So if there is an issue, like I would assume you're not going to be lending in New York, but because I suggest nobody to do that. Let the big banks do that. Let them worry about that foreclosure process. But I will certainly then we'll have to circle back in the beginning of the year once you do get the states vetted. And let's definitely broadcast that back out to Lender Nation. So fortunately, the podcast did start here in the Houston area, but it is. Uh, branched out and, and people getting com you know communication from Tennessee, uh, Washington D.C., Washington State, California. So it's um, fortunately it's, it's branching out. It's, I don't want to be just Texas specific, but I like Texas because of our foreclosure laws. Which if something goes south, it's a quick remedy to take that house back or right. you know, foreclose, right. wholesale it out, give it you know sell it to right. another investor or, or sell the note, whatever. So that's interesting. Okay, so cool. Yeah, I, I like that you're uh, you're Texas specific, but you're branching out. That's good. When it comes to the borrower, because I, I do have some borrowers that listen, it sounds like you loan on, on pretty much any asset, single family, residential, apartment, multifamily, and do you loan on commercial as well? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. All right. So basically any asset class. Do you do like industrial? Uh, oh, well, yes, absolutely. I mean, we've got two crazy deals that we've done recently. There was actually a Forbes.com article written if you wanted to look up online look up the uh, Falstaff Brewery project in Galveston, Texas. That particular project is a massive, massive undertaking. This brewery complex had been vacant since the 1980s. And a gentleman that I know went in and bought the whole complex. It's a big industrial complex. And it really had about five buildings to it. And he just went in one building at a time and started repurposing those buildings and rehabbing those buildings 
And we've been involved in three of those particular projects so far. Okay. Okay. So any, you know, so from people who are watching Fix and Flip to the guys that've been the uh, commercial and industrial, you'll you'll uh, you'll loan on. on yeah, we've got another uh, loan right now on a gentleman bought a old country club and golf course. It was fifty some acres that had been abandoned again for decades and went in and he replatted everything and built it into a uh, waterfront community and made 47 lots out of it. Wow. And we were the money behind that. In fact, we're still in that deal. He's probably 90 days away from pouring the streets. Once he gets that done, he's already got the lots sold to a premium builder in the area. So uh, we'll be out of that project once the streets are laid because a bank will then come in and take that over and give him cheap money from that point forward. But we help with the ugly part. We help when the bank, when the banker wouldn't possibly go look at that project, that's when you use us. We help them get the projects pretty. And then once they're pretty, then the banker can see it and they can come in with their cheap money and cash us out. That, and you bring up a very good point again about the banks and you know, two points I want to make. One, the banks won't lend you money when you need it. They only lend money when you don't. The individual anyway. That is 100% accurate, by the <laughs> way. That is 100% accurate. I always put it this way, Keith. Banks will never get you to your desired lifestyle. But once you get to your desired lifestyle, bankers will come knocking. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Drysdale from the Beverly Hillbillies, right? You know, <laughs> like once you get that stack of cash, then they're at your feet. One thing that banks won't allow and this is something I know that you guys not only is a product that you have at Advertise, but it's something that I would love my listeners for you to explain to my listeners is in the owner finance game, let's say a house is not performing and let's say Chase Bank has the mortgage, right? Investor goes in, would buy it, would then turn around and sell that house under owner financing and essentially put another mortgage and wrap it around the original one. Banks will not allow that, but you guys will come in and say, okay, we're going to loan the, the principal money up front. You're going to give us whatever the terms are. You can then, Mr. Investor, turn around and sell it with owner financing. So the end buyer pays the investor who then pays you. Is that correct? That's correct. I actually invented that product about two and a half years ago. I'm not very creative, Keith, so I named it the wrappable loan. Uh, (laughs) That's what it is. (laughs) It's what it is, right? I wasn't creative enough to come up with anything better. So in our office, we just call it the wrap for short. And essentially, that one came from an investor friend of mine named Rudy, who works in the Houston market. And he, you know, he does some fix and flips, but he loves to do owner finance. He loves to buy the property, fix it up, and then sell it to a family on owner finance terms, somebody that either doesn't want to or can't get a bank loan. And by doing that, he can charge uh, usually at full retail or even maybe 10% above full retail for the property, he doesn't have to deal with appraisals and whether the appraisal is going to come in or not because he's the lender. He's not going to require an appraisal. He's not going to have to deal with uh, home inspectors typically because he's the lender. He's not going to require a home inspection. He's not going to have to make concessions on the price. He's not going to have to pay realtor's fees most generally. He can put a couple bandit signs in the yard and have it sold in a week, most generally. So what happens is he's going to end up with a net on that property of somewhere between 15 and 25% more than if he would have listed it with a realtor on the MLS and paid the typical realtor fees, closing costs, concessions, seller, buyer contributions to their closing costs. I mean, all the other horse crap that you get hit with as a seller, right? It's horse crap when you're the seller, right? (laughs) Because it's just more things taking away from your potential profit. And when you use the owner finance strategy, you don't have any of those things. So we're looking at a swing of, on my best estimation, somewhere between 15 and 25% swing. So Rudy comes to me and says, I love doing these. I've figured out how profitable they are, but I can't get the underlying money for it. Obviously, every time I sell one, if I sell it on a 15 or a 20 year note to the family that's going to live in it, I can't hold that paper for 15 or 20 years. I'd be out of money in, in one year of doing this. Right. And that's if I had a big pocket full. 
And I said, well, Rudy, it's just not done. Banks and lenders put something in the terms called a do on sale clause that would then trigger if you did sell it to your family on owner finance terms. And they, if they know about it, most generally they're going to call the note. Now, one could argue it's done a lot and banks most generally are big enough that most generally they don't find out about it. But it's always the worry about what if they do. And so Rudy being the guy he is, he says, I know it's not done. I'm asking why. Why can't it be done? You know, I don't know. I've never thought about that. I gave it a lot of thought. And over the next six or eight months with consultations with my partner and with our attorneys and with other people in the industry, I said, you know what? I don't really see a reason it can't be done. I don't know why banks don't like it, but it was started back after the 80s when a lot of people were assuming cheap notes. Yeah, That's where it originated from. Back prior to the 80s, there was no such thing as a due on sale clause in most notes. But when rates were really cheap and had 30-year terms, and then rates skyrocketed to 15, 16, 17%, on an owner-occupant 30-year loan, a lot of people couldn't afford that. So they just said, hey, look, instead of me going and getting a new loan at these ridiculous rates, why don't I just take over and assume yours? And so a lot of people uh, were taking advantage of the bank. You know, people will always find a way around the rules, right? So, <laughs> Humans will. Absolutely. So that's where it really originated. And it was a protection for the banks against being stuck in low rate loans longer than they would typically need to. We in the lending industry and banks included know that a 30 year loan is not going to go 30 years. The average 30 year loan is going to go five to eight years because that's how long between people selling their home typically. Now, will some go 30? Yes, but some will also go one or two. And so they're going to average somewhere between five and eight years. And the banks did not want that average to go up by people being allowed to assume, assume, assume. Now a 30-year loan would actually be a 30-year commitment to that interest rate. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. No, yeah, it, it certainly does. It's, it's funny because growing up in the Houston area in the, in the 80s, 70s and 80s, I saw the, I learned, I think around 82, what an eviction notice was because they built this brand new neighborhood behind my house. They, they took away our play field in the woods and built all these, basically these starter homes. And they outrageous interest rates were being charged and people couldn't afford them. And a neighbor just a few houses down from us actually moved in. She had gotten divorced and she and her daughter moved in by assuming the note on the house. And yeah. she said, you know, that's the only way she could do it because she couldn't afford a 15% note yeah. buying a retail house. And so- yeah. I do cast banks in an evil shadow and an evil light. They're not all evil, but I mean, I do understand the do on sale clause. I don't like it personally as an investor. <laughs> well, of course. Of but course. Yeah, yeah, I certainly yeah. understand it. As a lender, I want to protect my position. So I don't hold that against the banks at all. So that's where it came from. The wrappable note, uh, we said, look, if we charged a reasonable enough interest rate to hedge against the risk and we reduced the time frame. We're not doing 30-year notes. The wrappable note is a 20-year note. It's a fully amortized 20-year note. I say, you know what? If we found the sweet spot for rate that met the market's needs, but it also protected us against rising rates, we could do that and we could lock in to 20 years with a due on sale clause. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. No. <laughs> you do not have a due on sale clause. Beautiful. None. So it is yeah, truly, so yeah, because if it's wrappable, it's yeah, you can't wrap it. Yeah. You can't have it. Yeah. I'm, yep. Yeah. Yep. You're a good storyteller. I was following you down the trail. You were leaving the breadcrumbs and I was, I was eating all of them. <laughs> I had to make sure you were still awake over there. But yeah, I was like, wait, 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 wait. No, no, no. Yeah, no. That's, that's, um, so that, that's, so yeah, anyone who's out there who wants to do owner financing, that definitely, you, I would suggest looking into that product because it, that to me was, when I saw that you guys were doing that, I was like, wow, that's innovative and something that's definitely needed in the market. So, I could go on pretty much all day asking you questions, but I know you got a, a commitment after this. And I want to say thank you. I was supposed to record this. We were supposed to record Tom and I yesterday and I had to bail out on him and he was, he had actually even left early to go to Dallas so that he could 
find time and be ready to go. And then I bailed on them. So Tom, I really do appreciate you coming back on. Uh, so thank you for coming back, giving such a great interview. And I just have a few more questions, which is if someone came to you and said, Hey, Tom, I want to start off in private lending, you know, a private mortgage notes, or what piece of advice would you give them? Well, the first thing that I would want to know, and I do this all the time with people, is there's a few questions they've got to ask themselves to determine where they want to start, right? The first question is, what kind of capital are they working with? The second question is, what kind of experience do they have with rehabbing, with fix and flips or construction or things like that? I always use my mom as an example. My mom is 77, 72 years old, right? Mm -hmm. And what would I want her to have? So what would I want her out there doing fix and flip loans? Heck no. She's not going to be able and capable and doesn't have the network to handle a foreclosure. If she had to foreclose on a fix and flip project that was only half completed, right? Because that's when they always foreclose is when they're half completed. <laughs> And, and you got to go in and pick up all the pieces, right? It's never when it's done and it was done right mm. and it's beautiful and ready to sell at a premium. No, it's when the stuff that was done needs redone because it wasn't done correctly. That's when you take over those projects, most generally on a foreclosure basis. So you know, I guess I come from the finance world. And when I was selling mutual funds and things like that for a living, we had something that we had to fill out every time somebody brought us money. And it was called, a, the SEC required it in every file. It was a huge fine if you didn't have it. And it's something called a suitability checklist. And what it meant was every single client that brought us money to invest in a mutual fund or an annuity or whatever it was, we would sit down with them and ask, you know, five to eight key questions that would determine what type of investment was suitable for them. And I guess I just still use that as my basis, even though it's not required in our industry, I feel it should. And so I just use it as a best practice in our company. And I want to know what's suitable for that person. Because the last thing I want to see is somebody losing money when they thought they were going to be making money. And Keith, I've been around this a long time. You know that. And I've seen it more often than I like. So what are their resources? What are their talents? What is their experience? And based on those things, that will lead me to explain what they should do first. Perfect. Yeah, no, that's the whole reason for this podcast is nobody's out there telling people how to be safe or how to look out for themselves even, you know? Nope. And there's nope. no investment is foolproof or fail safe. Nope. And no. well, it's but, called investing and not saving, right? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that's a very good answer because that, yeah, it's, you know, what are you working with? What's your background? And what are you comfortable with? Do you like to play poker or do you like to play blackjack? The speed of the game. What do you, and that's probably gambling is probably not the analogy I should be using. That's probably a bad analogy for investing. <laughs> we got to find you a better one than that. How about a um, hundred yard dash or a marathon? There you go. It's yeah. probably a, a more apt analogy there yeah. because I kind of got into real estate because I figured to me, the stock market was like the biggest casino ever. And I got lucky, thought I knew what I was doing. And let me tell you, that account got closed a long time ago. <laughs> so, and because there was no funds left, I completely messed up. So I like your suitability though. I like that. I think that's very key. And no matter what, whether it be stock bonds, mutual funds, real estate, notes, whatever, there's, exactly. you got to exactly. match your personality with the investment vehicle. So, Two final questions. What, how do people get in touch with you? If they want to loan or borrow, how do, uh, how do they get in touch with you? Yeah, so both can be accomplished at our website, and it's a real easy website address to remember, www.ils, that stands for Investor Loan Source, dot cash instead of dot com. So it's ils dot cash. And you can go there and learn about our loan products if you're a borrower and looking for funds for your real estate project. You can also, there's an invest with us tab at the top that talks about investing through our private equity fund, which I mentioned. It is a um, registered fund, exemption C, so I am allowed to advertise it. So there is no problems with that. I do have to mention it is for accredited investors only. Yep. And if somebody's not comfortable with the fund, like you, has to have that <laughs> first lien position, deed of trust in your little paws, that's fine. Or somebody that's maybe not accredited, but wants to get involved 
with us and wants to use our vetting process to do that, then take a look at the uh, purchasing notes page. We can certainly walk you through that process. Alex is our note sales girl at the El Campo office, and she would be happy to have uh, as many telephone and email conversations with you as necessary to get you comfortable with the process so that you can do that. Excellent. And all this information will be on the show notes page as well. So privatelenderpodcast.com. So definitely check that out. And uh, Tom, I've got one final question because you're a um, pretty smart guy. I know, and I like how you, you like simple math. I'm curious as to what book are you reading right now? You know, I was talking to a friend the other day and she said, hey, you need to read The Richest Man in Babylon again. Yes. Now, she knew that I had already read it. Pretty much everybody in our circles has read it at least once, right? Yeah. She's like, you know, I got it out the other day and I read it again and there was some new stuff that really jumped out at me. So if you haven't read it in a while, get it out. So I'm actually going to get that one out and read it again. My favorite book, and I've read it seven times so far, and I do keep track, and I still learn something every single time, is Success is Not an Accident by Tommy Newberry. Success is Not an Accident. By Tommy Newberry. Interesting. Well, I'll definitely put that in the show notes page. So tell us, give us a quick little rundown. What, what do you like so much about it? And it's seven well, times. I mean, obviously that. Well, this book was actually referred to me by a mega millionaire that I knew way back before I even got into real estate in my previous career in finance. This gentleman probably was pulling down $3 million a year, had a, at least $100 million net worth. And I was fortunate enough to be in a small group that was invited to his house to talk with him. You know, we're all standing around in the kitchen and he's got this book laying there. And so one of us asked, you know, about this book and he says, it's one of the best books I've ever read in my life. And coming from a guy as successful as him, that obviously resonated with me. Sure. And I said, well, why do you think that, that it's such a good book? It's the same thing you just asked me. And he says, you know, I can't even put my finger on why there is so many things in it that just hit me. He said, in fact, it hit me so hard, I just hired the author of the book as my personal success coach last week. <laughs> he said, I looked him up, I found him on the internet, I called him, and I hired him as my success coach. This guy is a centromillionaire, and he hired the guy as a success coach. If that doesn't tell you, you ought to read the damn book. I don't know what does. I was going to say, you know, they say success leaves clues, and that sounds like a pretty big clue. So, <laughs> And so I just, I, every time I read it, I get something else out of it that I did it before. That's, uh, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely going to check that out. I'll put that the whole, link. The whole crux of the book is success is all within us. It has nothing to do with outside things. And I'm such a huge believer in that anyway. We live in such a particularly, I think, more and more and more, an entitlement mentality society. And this book just crushes all of those thoughts, all of those little fragments that may be running around in your brain up there that are holding you back. Now, you could just get through two chapters and throw it down and say, I don't like this book too. And that is the danger of that book. But it is brutally honest. And it's kind of like me. It is what it is. You either like it or you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I've been a fan ever since I met you, so I'm definitely going to run out and get this book uh, or at least get it off of Amazon here shortly and get into it. So, Tom, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your day, your most precious asset, your time and giving it to Lin myself and Linder Nation. And I definitely I will contact your marketing person and we will definitely want to get another episode on fractionalization. I, that's a rabbit hole I really want to go down. And I think you're the perfect person to do that. So. I know you've got to get running. So again, thank you. And if there's anything I can ever do for you, which I doubt there is, but <laughs> if there is, please let me know. And I wish you all the best. Well, I appreciate the offer, Keith, and I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be on your podcast. So thank you very much. Absolutely. Take care. All right. I'd like to thank Tom Barry for a great interview and sharing his knowledge with us today. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And now is the time I have to grovel with you. I'm going to ask you to please go rate and review the podcast, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, hopefully soon on Spotify and iHeartRadio. But wherever you're listening to this, please drop me a, a rating and a review, at least a rating. would appreciate a review. I'd love some feedback. And I'm going to start reading those on the air here hopefully soon. Just bear with me. 
uh, giving some people some shout outs. So anyway, please do that. iTunes, unfortunately, is still the 400 pound gorilla in the room. So if you could go to iTunes and do that, that would help me out greatly because then it'll put this podcast in front of more and more people. And while you're at it, go ahead and connect with me on social media, Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, Keith Baker and the Private Lender Podcast. And uh, that'll get you there. Or just go to the privatelenderpodcast.com. Sorry, that's privatelenderpodcast.com. And since you've made it this far, I just want to say thank you again and to let you know that I've carved my goal in stone and I've drawn a line in the sand for a date. So the Private Lender Academy will be launching in January of 2019. I hope it's January 1st. It'll be a great anniversary day because that's the day that I launched this podcast on 2018, January 1, 2018. But I'm going to offer a, first off, will be a completely free training on private lending. And this will be completely for newbies. So if you're already into the mix, I would still love you to go ahead and take the free course and provide your feedback. Tell me what sucks. Tell me what you like, what's missing, or what's not coming across clearly. But anyway, I will have more and more, uh, or sorry, I should should have uh, some links that you can go to to sign up to get on the waiting list. And I mean, what do you have to, like, I haven't spammed anybody yet because I haven't emailed anybody on my list. And I know online marketers are cringing right now. But yes, I do want to build a list. However, I want to respect my listener. I want to respect the people who are supporting me and providing me feedback. And I hate, I can't stand getting overburdened with emails. If I don't consider myself that much, or I'm, I don't consider myself a very important person. And yet my email, my inboxes are, are quite full. So I want to respect yours, but you can go get on the waiting list and hopefully soon I'll get that up and running by the next episode and you can go ahead and get on the waiting list. And how many times am I going to say that and get notified when it goes live? And like I said, the first course will be completely free and I'm looking at ways to, what's the best way to provide education? Is it, you know, would it be through a course or would it be through like, you know, kind of a a weekly thing, you know, uh, live webinars? You know, even maybe an email course that, you know, that's drip fed out a chapter a day or something. I don't know. Anyway, uh, but I've put it in the sand 2019. I'm going to launch it and hope you guys are going to be, um, be on board with me. And uh, like a drug dealer, the first one's free. I'm hearing that people are paying 50 and a hundred thousand dollars for gurus right now. And that's just, to me, that's just asinine. And I'm not going to do that to you, uh, my loyal listener. So anyhow, I think I've rambled on long enough. Please go to the show notes. This is uh, episode 43. I uh, wish you guys a uh, happy fall, happy investing, happy lending, and all the successes that you can't measure. I'll see you on the next episode. Take care. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time.